morning, Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Aaron. Three, two, one, take two. Good morning. Welcome to Aaron Mills Town Center, the home of the world's largest permanent point of purchase video wall installation. My name is Kelvin Fluck, and I'm your video host all day here at EMTV. I want to take this opportunity to extend a very special and warm welcome to the film crew from Necessary Illusions. We've got an excellent lineup of television programming for you today, so let's get on with it. So how long have they been working on this documentary? Gosh, they've been... Working on it. I don't know how long, but they, I know every every country I show up, they're always there. They're there, huh? Yeah, they were in England, they were in Japan, all over the place. Jeez. Okay, they must have 500 hours worth of tape by wow. now. But they put together a real doozy when they're done, huh? Yeah, I can't imagine who's going to want to hear somebody talk for an hour, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess they know what they're doing. So where are y'all from? <laughs> We're making a film about Noam Chomsky. Does anybody know who Noam Chomsky is? No. Good afternoon and welcome to Wyoming Talks. My guest today is well-known intellectual Noam Chomsky. Thank you for being on our program today. Very glad to be here. Well, I know probably the main purpose for your trip to Wyoming is to discuss thought control in a democratic society. Now, I'd say I'm just uh, Jane USA, and I say, well, gee, this is a uh, democratic society, and what do you mean thought control? I make up my own mind. I, I create my own destiny. What would you say to her? Mm -hmm. Well, I would suggest that Jane take a close look at uh, the way the media operate, the way the public relations in uh, industry operates, the extensive thinking that's been going on for a long, long period about the necessity for finding ways to marginalize and control the public in democratic society. But particularly to look at the evidence that's been accumulated about the way the major media, the sort of agenda-setting media, I mean the national press and the television and so on, the way that they shape and control the kinds of opinions that appear, the kinds of information that comes through, the sources to which they go, and so on. And I think that Jane will find some very surprising things about the democratic system. I'd like to welcome all of you to this lecture today. Several years ago, Professor Chomsky was described in the New York Times book review as follows. Judged in terms of the power, range, novelty, and influence of his thought, Noam Chomsky is arguably the most important intellectual alive. Professor Noam Chomsky. I gather there are some people out behind that blackness there, but if I don't look you in the eye, it's because I don't see you. All I see is the blackness. Uh, perhaps I ought to begin by reporting something that's never read. Uh, the line about the arguably the most important intellectual in the world and so on comes from a publisher's blurb, and you also always got to watch those things, <laughs> because if you go back to the original, you'll find that that sentence is actually there. This is in the New York Times. But the next sentence is, since that's the case, how can he write such terrible things about American foreign policy? <laughs> and they never quote that point. 
but in fact, if it wasn't for that second sentence, I would begin to think that I'm doing something wrong. And I'm not joking about that. Uh, it's true that the emperor doesn't have any clothes, but the emperor doesn't like to be told it. And the emperor's uh, lapdogs, like the New York Times, are not going to uh, enjoy the experience if you do. Good evening. I'm Bill Moyers. What's more dangerous, the big stick or the big lie? Governments have used both against their own people. Tonight I'll be talking with a man who has been thinking about how we can see the developing lie. He says that propaganda is to democracy what violence is to a dictatorship. But he hasn't lost faith in the power of common people to speak up for the truth. You have said that we live entangled in webs of endless deceit that we live in a highly indoctrinated society where elementary truths are easily buried. Mm -hmm. Elementary truths such as? Such as the fact that we invaded South Vietnam, or the fact that we're standing in the way of significant, and have for years, of significant moves towards uh, arms negotiation, or the, the fact that the military system is to an, a substantial extent, not totally, but to a substantial extent, a mechanism by which the general population is compelled to provide a subsidy to high technology industry. Since they're not going to do it, if you ask them to, you have to deceive them into doing it. I think there are many truths like that, and we don't face them. Do you believe in common sense? I mean, you're oh, absolutely. You I do believe in, in Cartesian common sense. I think people have the capacities to uh, see through the deceit in which they're ensnared, but they got to make the effort. Seems a little incongruous to hear a man from the ivory tower of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a scholar, a distinguished linguistics uh, scholar, talk about common people with such appreciation. I think that scholarship, at least the field that I work in, uh, has the opposite consequences. Well, my own studies in language and human cognition uh, demonstrate, to me at least, what remarkable creativity ordinary people have. The very fact that people talk to one another is a reflection, and just in a normal way, I don't mean anything particularly fancy, uh, reflects deep-seated features of human creativity, which in fact separate human beings from any other biological system we know. Tonight, scientists talk to the animals, but are they talking back? <laughs> the Journal with Barbara Frum and Mary Lou Finley. Communicating with animals is a serious scientific pursuit. This is Nim Chomsky. Nim, jokingly named after the great linguist Noam Chomsky, was the great hope of animal communication in the 1970s. For four years, Petito and others coached him in sign language. But in the end, they decided it was a lost cause. Nim could ask for things, but not much more. I would have loved to have a conversation with Nim and understand how he looked at the universe. He failed to communicate that information to me, now we, and we gave him every opportunity. Noam Chomsky, theorist of language and political activist, has had an extraordinary career. I can think of none like it in recent American history, and few anywhere at any time. He has literally transformed the subject of linguistics. At the same time, he's become one of the most consistent critics of power politics in all its protean guises. Scholar and propagandist, his two careers apparently reinforce each other. In 1957, he published his Syntactic Structures, which began what has frequently been called the Chomskyan Revolution in Linguistics. Like a latter-day Copernicus, Chomsky proposed a radically new way of looking at the theory of grammar. Chomsky worked out the formal rules of a universal grammar which generated the specific rules of actual or natural languages. The general approach I'm taking seems to me rather simple-minded uh, and unsophisticated, but nevertheless correct. Uh, <laughs> Later he came to argue that such systems are innate features of human beings. They belong to the characteristics of the species and have been, in effect, programmed into the genetic equipment of the mind like the machine language in a computer. Uh, one needn't be interested in this question, of course. I am interested in it. And the interesting question from this point of view would be what is the nature of the initial state? That is, what is human nature in this respect? That in turn explains the... Astonishing 
you try that out next to him. Facility. 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 That in turn explains the astonishing facility that children have in learning the rules of natural language, no matter how complicated, incredibly quickly, from what are imperfect and often degenerate samples. Complain. Complicated. Complicated. It's a complicated word. Do you know what complicated means? It means it's complicated. If, in fact, our minds were a blank slate and experience wrote on them, we would be very impoverished creatures indeed. So the obvious hypothesis is that our language is the result of the unfolding of a genetically determined program. Well, plainly, there are different languages. In fact, the apparent variation of languages is quite superficial. It's certain, as, as, as certain as anything else, is that humans are not genetically programmed to learn one or another language. So you bring up a Japanese baby in Boston, it'll speak Boston English. And you bring up my child in Japan, it'll speak Japanese. Uh, and that means that the base, that from, that it fo from, from that it simply follows by logic that the basic structure of the languages must be essentially the same. Our task as uh, scientists is to try to determine exactly what those fundamental principles are that cause the knowledge of language to unfold in the manner in which it does under particular circumstances. And incidentally, I think there is no doubt that the same must be true of other aspects of human intelligence and uh, uh, systems of understanding and interpretation and uh, moral and aesthetic judgment and so on. The implications of these views have washed over the fields of psychology, education, sociology, philosophy, literary criticism, and logic. In the 50s and 60s, the bridge between your theoretical work and your political work seems to have been the attack on behaviorism. But now, behaviorism is no longer an issue, or so it seems. So how does this leave the link between your linguistics and your politics? Well, I've always regarded the link. I, I've never really perceived much of a link, to tell you the truth. Again, I would be very pleased to be able to discover intellectually convincing connections between my own anarchist convictions on the one hand and what I think I can demonstrate or at least begin to see about the nature of human intelligence on the other. But I simply can't find intellectually satisfying connections between those two domains. I can discover some tenuous points of contact. Il n'y a de créativité possible qu'à partir d'un système de règles. Le problème, alors, là, que je me pose, et où je ne suis pas peut-être tout à fait d'accord avec M. Chomsky, c'est lorsque il place euh, ses régularités à l'intérieur, en quelque sorte, de l'esprit ou de la nature humaine. Je me demande si le système de régularité, de contraintes, qui rendent possible une science, on ne peut pas les trouver ailleurs, en dehors même de l'esprit humain, dans des formes sociales, dans des rapports de production, dans les, des luttes de classe, etc. If it is correct, as I believe it is, that a fundamental element of human nature is the need for uh, creative work, for creative inquiry, for, uh, for free creation uh, without the arbitrary limiting effects of coercive institutions, then, of course, it will follow that a decent society should maximize the possibilities for this fundamental human characteristic to be realized. Now, a federated, decentralized uh, system of free associations incorporating economic as well as social institutions would be what I refer to as anarcho-syndicalism, and it seems to me that it is the appropriate uh, form of social organization for an advanced technological society in which human beings do not have to be forced into the position of tools, of cogs in the machine. Since the 1960s, Noam Chomsky has been the voice of a very characteristic brand of rationalist libertarian socialism. He's attacked the abuses of power wherever he saw them, He's made himself deeply unpopular by his criticism of American policy. The subservience of the intelligentsia, the degradation of Zionism, the distortions of media and self-delusions in prevailing ideologies.
under the liberal administrations of the 1960s, the club of academic intellectuals designed and implemented the Vietnam War and uh, uh, other uh, similar, though smaller, actions. This particular community is a very relevant one to consider at a place like MIT because, of course, you're all free to enter, enter this community. In fact, you're invited and encouraged to enter uh, the community of technical intelligentsia and weapons designers and counterinsurgency uh, experts and pragmatic planners of an American empire is one that you have a great deal of inducement to uh, become associated with. The inducements, in fact, are very real. The rewards in power and affluence and prestige and authority are quite significant. Jamie. This came with the mail. Be with you in a second. Uh, Still got their cameras. Okay. Huh? I'll start. In, in your essay, Language and Freedom, you write, social action must be animated by a vision of a future society. I was wondering what vision of a future society uh, an animates you. Oh, well, I have my own ideas as to what a future society should look like. Uh, I've written about them. I mean, I think that we should, at the most general level, we should be seeking out forms of authority and domination and uh, challenging their legitimacy. Now, sometimes they are legitimate. That is, let's say, they're needed for survival. So, for example, I wouldn't suggest uh, that during the Second World War, uh, the, the forms of authority, we had a totalitarian society, basically, and I thought there was some justification for that under the wartime conditions. Uh, and there are other forms of, uh, so, so for uh, relations between parents and children, for example, involve forms of coercion, which are sometimes justifiable. Uh, but any such, any, any form of coercion and uh, control requires justification, and most of them are completely unjustifiable. Now, at various stages of human civilization, it's been possible to challenge some of them, but not others. Others are too deep-seated, or you don't see them, or whatever. And so at any particular point, you try to detect those forms of authority and domination, uh, which, which are subject to change, uh, and which uh, uh, do not have any legitimacy, in fact, which often strike at fundamental human rights and your understanding of fundamental human nature and rights. Well, what are the major things, say, today? There are some that are being addressed, in a way. Um, uh, the feminist movement is addressing some. The civil rights movement is addressing others. The one major one that's not being seriously addressed is the one that's really at the core of the system of domination, and that's private control over, uh, over resources. And that means an attack on the fundamental structure of state capitalism. Now, I think that's in order. That's not something far off in the future. Your life work. The alphabet has only 26 letters. With these 26 magic symbols, however, millions of words are written every day. Nowhere else are people so addicted to information and entertainment via the printed word. Every day the world comes thumping on the American doorstep and nothing that happens anywhere remains long a secret from the American newspaper reader. It comes to us pretty casually, the daily paper. But behind its arrival on your doorstep is one of journalism's major stories, how it got there. There is a standard view about democratic societies and the role of the media within them. It's expressed, for example, by Supreme Court Justice Powell when he spoke of the crucial role of the media in affecting the societal purpose of the First Amendment, namely enabling the public to assert meaningful control over the political process. That kind of formulation expresses the understanding that democracy requires free access to uh, information and ideas and opinion, uh, and uh, uh, the same conceptions hold not only with regard to the media, 
but with regard to educational institutions, uh, publishing, uh, the intellectual community generally. It is basic to the health of a democracy that no phase of government activity escape the scrutiny of the press. Here, reporters are assigned to stories fateful not only to our nation, but to all nations. Congress, says the First Amendment, shall pass no law abridging the freedom of the press. And the chief executive himself throws open the doors of the White House to journalists representing papers of all shades of political opinion. But it is worth bearing in mind that there is a contrary view. And in fact, the contrary view is very widely held and deeply rooted in our own civilization. Uh, it goes back to the origins of modern democracy, to the 17th century English Revolution, uh, which was a complicated affair like most popular revolutions. Uh, there was a struggle between parliament representing largely elements of the gentry and the merchants and the royalists representing other elite groups, and they fought it out. But like many popular revolutions, there was also a lot of popular ferment going on that was opposed to all of them. There were popular movements that were questioning everything. The relation between master and servant, the right of authority altogether, all kinds of things were being questioned. Uh, there was a lot of radical publishing. The printing presses had just come into existence. And this disturbed all the elites on both sides of the Civil War. So as one historian pointed out at the time in 1660, uh, he criticized the radical Democrats, the ones we're calling for what we would call democracy, because they are making the people so curious and so arrogant that they will never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. Now, underlying these doctrines, which were very widely held, uh, is a certain conception of democracy. It's a game for elites. Uh, it's not for the ignorant masses who have to be marginalized, uh, diverted, and controlled, of course, for their own good. Uh, the same principles were upheld in the American colonies. The dictum of the founding fathers of American democracy that, I'm quoting, the people who own the country ought to govern it. Uh, quoting John Jay. Ah! Now, in modern times, for elites, this contrary view about the intellectual life and the media and so on, this contrary view, in fact, is the standard one, I think, apart from rhetorical flourishes. From Washington, D.C., he's intellectual, author, and linguist, uh, Professor Noam Chomsky. Manufacturing Consent. What is that title meant to describe? Well, the title is actually borrowed from uh, a book by Walter Lippmann, written back uh, around 1921, in which he described what he called the manufacture of consent as a revolution in the practice of democracy. What it amounts to is a technique of control. Uh, and he said this was useful and necessary because uh, the common interests, the general concerns of all people, elude the public. The public just isn't up to dealing with them. And they have to be the domain of what he called a specialized class. Uh, notice that that's the opposite of the standard view about democracy. Uh, there's a version of this expressed by the uh, highly respected moralist and theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, who was very influential on contemporary policymakers. Uh, his view was that rationality belongs to the cool observer, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason but faith. And this naive faith requires necessary illusion and emotionally potent oversimplifications which are provided by the myth maker to keep the ordinary person on course. It's not the case, as the naive might think, that indoctrination is inconsistent with democracy. Rather, as this whole line of thinkers observes, it's the essence of democracy. The point is that in 
a military state or a feudal state or what we would nowadays call a totalitarian state, it doesn't much matter what people think because you've got a bludgeon over their head and you can control what they do. But when the state loses the bludgeon, when you can't control people by force, and when the voice of the people can be heard, you have this problem. Uh, it may make people so curious and so arrogant that they don't have the humility to submit to a civil rule, and therefore you have to control what people think. And the standard way to do this is to resort to what in more honest days used to be called propaganda, manufacture of consent, uh, creation of necessary illusions, various ways of either marginalizing the general public or reducing them to apathy in some fashion. The oldest of two boys, Avram Noam Chomsky, was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1928. As a Jewish child, the anti-Semitism of the time affected him. Both parents taught Hebrew, and he became fascinated by literature, reading translations of French and Russian classics. He also took an interest in a grammar book written by his father on Hebrew of the Middle Ages. He recalls a childhood absorbed in reading, curled up in a sofa, often borrowing up to 12 books at once from the library. He is married to Carol, and they have three children. I don't like to impose on my wife and children a form of life that they certainly haven't selected for themselves, namely one of public exposure or exposure to the public media. That's their choice, and I don't believe that they have themselves selected this. I don't impose it on them. I would like to protect them from it, frankly. Uh, second, the sort of perhaps principal point is that I'm rather against the idea, the whole notion of uh, developing uh, public personalities uh, who are treated as uh, stars of one kind or another, where aspects of their personal life are supposed to have some significance and so on. Take one in the reception room. You said that you were just like us. You went to school, got good grades, and what made you start being critical, you know, and seeing them different? What started the change? You know what I mean? Well, you know, there are all kinds of personal factors in anybody's life. I mean, first of all, don't forget I grew up in a depression. My parents actually happened to have jobs, which was kind of unusual. They were Hebrew school teachers, so sort of lower middle class. For them, uh, everything revolved around being Jewish, Hebrew and Palestine in those days and so on. And I grew up in that milieu. So, you know, I learned Hebrew and went to Hebrew school, became a Hebrew school teacher, went to Hebrew college, led youth groups, uh, summer camps, Hebrew camps, the whole business the branch of the Zionist movement that I was part of was all involved in socialist binationalism and Arab Jewish cooperation and all sorts of nice stuff. You're hopping on a train and uh, going up to New York and hanging out at anarchist bookstores on Fourth Avenue and, and talking to. Uh, they didn't mind your because. Uh, class relatives there. I mean, I, I don't want to totally trust my childhood memories, obviously, but the family was split up. Like a lot of Jewish families, it went in all sorts of directions. There were sectors that were super orthodox, uh, there were other sectors that were very radical and very assimilated and working class intellectuals. You know. And that's the sector that I naturally gravitated towards. It was a very lively intellectual culture. For one thing, it was a working class culture, had working class values. 
values of solidarity, socialist values, and so on. Uh, there was a sense somehow things were going to get better. An institutional structure was around the method of fighting, you know, of organizing, of doing things, uh, which had some hope. And I also had the advantage of having gone to a uh, experimental progressive school, to a Dewey school, which was quite good, uh, run by a university there. And, uh, you know, there was no such thing as competition. There was no such thing as being a good student. Uh, I mean, literally, the concept of being a good student didn't even arise until I got to high school. I went to the academic high school and suddenly discovered I'm a good student, you know, and I hated high school because I had to do all the things you have to do to get into college. But until then, it was kind of a free... Uh, pretty open system. And I don't know, there are lots of other things. Maybe I was just cantankerous. As a historian, I have read with interest and amazement your long review article of Gabriel Jackson's Spanish Civil War, and that's a very respectable piece of history, and I can appreciate how much work goes into that. When you know when you I did that work? When did you then? I did that work in the early 1940s when I was about 12 years old. The first article I wrote was right after the fall of Barcelona in the school newspaper. It was a, a lament about the, the rise of fascism in 1939. Actually, I guess one of the people who was the biggest influence in my life was an uncle who uh, had never gone past fourth grade. He was, you know, had a background in crime, and then left-wing politics, and all sorts of things. But he was a uh, hunchback. And as a result, he could get a newsstand in New York. So they had some program for people with physical disabilities. And some of you are from New York, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know the 72nd Street kiosk? Yes. You know that? Right. That's right. That's where I got my political education. At 72nd Street, there's a place where you come out of the subway, and there's everybody goes towards 72nd Street. And there were two newsstands on that side, which were doing fine. And there's two newsstands on the back. And nobody comes out the back, you know. And that's where his news is. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very lively place. He was a very bright guy. It was the 30s. Uh, there were a lot of uh, emigres, you know, and so on. A lot of people were hanging around there. And in the evening, especially, it was sort of a literary political salon. You know, every kind of guy is hanging around, arguing and talking. And as a kid, like 11, 12 years old, the biggest excitement was to work the newsstand. You write in Manufacturing Consent that it's the primary function of the mass media in the United States to mobilize public support for the special interests that dominate the government and the private sector. What are those interests? Well, if you want to understand the way any society works, ours or any other, uh, the first place to look is who makes, who is in a position to make the decisions that determine the way the society functions. Societies differ, but in ours, the major decisions over what happens in the society, decisions over investment and production and distribution and so on, are in the hands of a relatively concentrated network of major corporations and conglomerates and investment firms and so on. They are also the ones who staff the major executive positions in the government, and they're the ones who own the media, and they're the ones who have to be in a position to make the decisions. They have an overwhelmingly dominant role in the way life happens, you know, what's done in the society. Within the economic system, by law and in principle, they dominate. The control over resources and the need to satisfy their interests imposes very sharp constraints on the political system and uh, the ideological system. When we talk about manufacturing of consent, whose consent is being manufactured? We, we can, to start with, there are two different groups. We can get more into more detail. But at the first level of approximation, there's two targets for propaganda. One is what's sometimes called the political class. There's maybe 20% of the population, which is relatively educated, more or less articulate, uh, that plays some kind of role in decision making. Uh, they're supposed to sort of participate in social life, either as managers or cultural managers like say teachers and writers and so on they're supposed to vote they're supposed to play some role in the way economic and political and cultural life goes on now their consent is crucial one group that has to be deeply indoctrinated then there's maybe 80 percent of the population uh, whose main function is to follow orders 
and not to think, you know, and not to pay attention to anything. And they're the ones who usually pay the costs. All right, Professor Chomsky, no, um, you outlined a model with filters that mm -hmm. propaganda is uh, sent through that's way to the public. Can you briefly outline those? It's basically an institutional analysis of the major media, what we call a propaganda model. We're talking primarily about the national media, those media that sort of set a general agenda that others more or less adhere to, to the extent that they even pay much attention to uh, national or international affairs. Now, the elite media are the sort of the agenda-setting media. That means the New York Times, the Washington Post, the major television channels, and so on. They set the general framework. Local media more or less adapt to their structure. World News. It doesn't sound like it says that there's a beachhead. I think, I think, I think 628 is a good one. Yeah, but I think, I think, I think 6 is a good start. This is the operative sound bite for us. He's, he's out. He's going to hear on the times. He's got a minute for all the time, so that's... I love this sound bite. Okay, we're going to And they do this in all sorts of ways by selection of topics, by distribution of concerns, by emphasis and framing of issues, by filtering of information, by bounding of debate within certain limits. Two and a half minutes to air. No. 45 seconds. They determine, they select, they shape, they control, they restrict uh, in order to serve the interests of dominant elite groups in society. There is an unusual amount of attention focused today on the five nations of Central America. This is Democracy's Diary. Here for our instruction are triumphs and disasters, the pattern of life's changing fabric. Here is great journalism, a revelation of the past, a guide to the present, and a clue to the future. The New York Times is certainly the most important newspaper in the United States, and one could argue the most important newspaper in the world. Uh, the New York Times plays an enormous role in shaping the perception of the current world on the part of the politically active, educated classes. Also, the New York Times has a special role, and I believe its editors probably feel that they bear a heavy burden in the sense that the New York Times creates history. What happened years ago may have a bearing on what happens tomorrow. Millions of clippings are preserved in the Times Library, all indexed for instant use, a priceless archive of events and the men who make them. That is, history is what appears in the New York Times archives. The place where people will go to find out what happened is the New York Times. Therefore, it's extremely important if history is going to be shaped in an appropriate way, that certain things appear, certain things not appear, certain questions be asked, other questions be ignored, uh, and that issues be framed in a particular fashion. Now, in whose interests uh, is the history being so shaped? Well, I think that's not very difficult to answer. The process by which people make up their minds on this is a much more mysterious process than you would ever guess from reading manufacturing consent. There is a saying about legislation that legislation is like making sausage. Uh, that the less you know about how it's done, uh, the better for your appetite. The same is true of this business. If you're in a conference in which decisions are being made on what to put on page one or whatnot, you would get, I think, uh, the impression uh, that uh, important decisions were being made in a flip and, and frivolous way. But in fact, given the pressures of time to try to get things out, you resort to a kind of a shorthand. And uh, you have to fill that paper up every day. Uh, it's curious in a kind of a mirror image way that uh, Professor Chomsky is in total accord with Reed Irvine who at the right-wing end of the spectrum says exactly what Chomsky does about the insinuating influence of the press, of the big media, as, quote, agenda setters, to use one of the great uh, uh, buzzwords of the time. And, uh, of course, Reed Irvine sees this as a left-wing conspiracy of foisting liberal ideas in both domestic and foreign affairs on the American people. 
But in both cases, I think that the premise really is an insult to the intelligence of the people who consume news. Now, to eliminate confusion, all of this has nothing to do with liberal or conservative bias. According to the propaganda model, both liberal and conservative wings of the media, whatever those terms are supposed to mean, fall within the same framework of assumptions. Uh, in fact, if the system functions well, it ought to have a liberal bias, or at least appear to, because if it appears to have a liberal bias, that will serve to bound thought even more effectively. In other words, if the press is indeed adversarial and liberal and all these bad things, then how can I go beyond it? They're already so extreme in their opposition to power that to go beyond it would be to take off from the planet. So therefore, it must be that the presuppositions that are accepted in the liberal media are sacrosanct, can't go beyond them. Uh, and a well-functioning system would in fact have a bias of that kind. The media would then serve to say, in effect, thus far and no further. Uh, we, we ask, what would you expect of those media on just relatively uncontroversial guided free market assumptions? And when you look at them, you find a number of major factors uh, entering into determining what their products are. Uh, these are what we call the filters. So one of them, for example, is ownership. Who owns them? The major agenda-setting media, after all, what are they? as institutions in the society, what are they? Well, in the first place, they are major corporations, in fact, huge corporations. Uh, furthermore, they're integrated with and sometimes owned by even larger corporations, conglomerates, so for example, by Westinghouse and GE and so on. What I wanted to know was how specifically the elites control the media. What I mean is, I guess... It's like asking, how do the elites control General Motors? Well, why isn't that a question? I mean, General Motors is an institution of the elites. They don't have to control it. They own it. You know? Except, I guess, at a certain level, I think... Um, like, I, I, I guess I work with student press, and, I, and I, so I know, like, reporters and stuff. The, the and elites don't control the student press, but I'll tell you something. You try in the student press to do anything that breaks out of conventions, and you're going to have the whole business community around here down on your neck, and the, in, the university's going to get threatened, and, you know, I mean, depend, maybe nobody will pay any attention to you. That's possible. But if you get to the point where they can, don't stop paying attention to you, the pressures will start coming, because there are people with power. There are people who own the country, and they're not going to let the country get out of control. What do you think about that? This is the, the, the old cabal theory that, uh, that somewhere there's a, there's a room with a baize-covered desk, and there are a bunch of capitalists sitting around, and they're pulling uh, strength. These rooms don't exist. I mean, I hate to tell Noam Chomsky this. You don't, you don't, believe, you don't share that. I think it is the most absolute rubbish I've ever heard. This is the current fashion in the universities. You know, it's patent nonsense, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a nothing but a fashion. It's a way that uh, uh, intellectuals have of, of feeling like a clergy. I mean, there has to be something wrong. is major corporations which are parts of even bigger conglomerates. Now like any other corporation, they, they have a product which they sell to a market. Uh, the market is advertisers, that is other businesses. What keeps the media functioning is not the audience. They make money from their advertisers. And remember we're talking about the elite media, so they're trying to sell uh, a good product, a product which raises advertising rates. 
and ask your friends in the advertising industry, that means that they want to adjust their audience to the more elite and affluent audience that raises advertising rates. So what you have is institutions, corporations, big corporations, that are selling relatively privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, what point of view would you expect to come out of this? I mean, without any further assumptions, what you'd predict is that what comes out is a picture of the world, a perception of the world, that satisfies the needs and the interests and the perceptions uh, of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. Now, there are many other factors that press in the same direction. If people try to enter the system who don't have that point of view, they're likely to be excluded somewhere along the way. After all, no institution is going to happily design a mechanism to self-destruct. It's not the way institutions function. So they all work to exclude or marginalize or eliminate dissenting voices or alternative perspectives and so on because they're dysfunctional. They're dysfunctional to the institution itself. Um, do you think you've escaped the ideological indoctrination of the media and of society that you grew up in? Have I? Mm -hmm. Often not. I mean, I, when I look back and think of the things that I haven't done that I should have done, it's uh, uh, it's, it's very uh, uh, it's a uh, not a pleasant experience. So, what's the story of young gnome in the schoolyard? Yeah, another. I mean, that was a personal thing for me. I don't know why it's an interest to anyone else, but I do remember. Well, you drew certain conclusions. Well, about. yeah. I mean, I, it had a big influence on me. I mean, I remember when I was about six, I guess first grade. There was, there was the standard fat kid who everybody made fun of. And uh, I remember in the schoolyard, uh, he was on a, you know, standing on a, right outside the school classroom and a bunch of kids outside sort of taunting him and, you know, so on. And one of the kids actually brought over his older brother, sort of like from third grade instead of first grade, you know, big kid. And he was going to, you know, beat him up or something. And I remember going up to stand next to him, feeling somebody ought to help him. And I did for a while, and then I got scared and I went away. And I was very much ashamed of it afterwards and sort of felt, uh, you know, I'm not going to do that again. That's a feeling that's stuck with me. You, you should stick with the underdog. And the shame remained, you know, should have stayed there. You had already established, you were a professor at MIT, you'd made a reputation, you had a terrific career ahead of you. You decided to become a political activist. Now, here is a classic case of somebody whom the institution does not seem to have filtered out. I mean, you were a good boy up until then, were you? Um, or you'd always been a slight, some of them you were a rebel? Yeah, pretty much. I had been pretty much outside. You felt isolated. You felt out of sympathy with the prevailing currents of American life. But a lot of people do that. Suddenly, in 1964, yeah. you decide, I have to do something That's about right. this. What made you do that? Well, that was a very conscious decision and a very Imagine. uncomfortable decision because I knew what the consequences would be. I was in a very favorable position. I had the kind of work I liked. We had a lively, exciting department. The field was going well. Personal life was fine. I was living in a nice place, children growing up. Everything looked perfect, and I knew I was giving it up. And at that time, remember, it was not just giving talks. I began involved right away in resistance. Uh, and I expected to spend years in jail and came very close to it. In fact, my wife went back to graduate school in part because we assumed she's going to have to support the children. Uh, these were the expectations. And I recognized that if I returned to these interests, which were the dominant interests of my own youth, uh, life would become very uncomfortable. Because I know that the United States, you don't get sent to a psychiatric prison, and they don't send a death squad after you, and so on. But there are, uh, there are definite penalties for uh, breaking the rules. So these were real decisions. Uh, and it, it simply seemed at that point that it was just hopelessly immoral not to I'm Noam Chomsky. I'm a, on the faculty at MIT, and I've been uh, getting more and more heavily involved in anti-war activities for the last few years. Something happening here. Uh, beginning with uh, writing articles and making speeches and uh, speaking to congressmen and that sort of thing, and gradually getting involved more and more directly in 
uh, resistance activities of various sorts. I've come to the feeling myself that the most effective form of political action that uh, is open to a uh, responsible and concerned citizen at the moment is action that really involves direct uh, resistance, refusal to take part in what I think are war crimes, to raise the uh, domestic cost of American aggression overseas through uh, non-participation and a support for those who are refusing to uh, take part in particular draft resistance throughout the country. so much resistance from behind. Time we stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's I think that we can see quite clearly some very, very serious defects and flaws in our society, our level of culture, our institutions which are going to have to be corrected by operating outside of the framework that is commonly accepted. I think we're going to have to find new ways of political action. People in the street, singing songs and they carry inside. Mostly said, they fall outside. It's time we stop, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going on. I rejoice in your disposition to argue the Vietnam question, especially when I recognize what an act of self-control this must uh, involve. It does. Sure. It really does. Sure. I mean, I think and, that this is the kind of well. issue where... Well. Well. Yeah. Sometimes I lose my temper. <laughs> Maybe not tonight. Maybe not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because uh, if you would, I'd smash you in the goddamn face. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> you say, you say in your book... reason for not losing my temper. <laughs> <laughs> you say the war is simply an obscenity, a depraved act, by weak and miserable men. Including all of us. Including myself. Well, including every... That's the next sentence. Same yeah. sentence. Sure, oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. sure. Because you count everybody in the company of the guilty. I think that's true in this uh, case. Yeah. But th See, one of the points I was trying... This is a sense of theological observation, isn't it? Uh, no, I don't think so. Because as somebody points out, if everybody's guilty of everything, then nobody's guilty of anything. No, that's I don't... Well, that. no, I don't, I don't believe that. See, I think that... I think the point that I'm trying to make, and I think ought to be made, is that the real... Uh, at least to me, I say this elsewhere in the book, the, what seems to me uh, a very, in a sense, terrifying aspect of our society and other societies is the equanimity and the detachment with which sane, reasonable, sensible people mm -hmm. can observe such events. I think that's more terrifying than the occasional Hitler or LeMay or other that crops up. These people would not be able to operate were it not for the, this apathy and equanimity. And therefore, I think that it's, in some sense, the sane and reasonable and tolerant people who should, who, who share a, a very serious burden of guilt that they very easily throw on the shoulders of others who seem more extreme and more violent. Twelve million pounds of confetti dropped into New York City's so-called Canyon of Heroes. Americans were officially welcoming the troops home from the Persian Gulf War. So it worked out really great for us. I mean, uh, it just goes to show that we're a mighty nation and uh, we'll be there for no matter what comes along. I mean, it's the strongest country in the world and you got to be glad to live here. So tell me what you feel about uh, media coverage of the war. I guess it was good. It got to be a mu bit much after a while, but uh, I guess it was good to know everything, you know. I guess in Vietnam you didn't really know a lot was going on, but here you pretty much up to the to the moment on everything, so I guess it was good to be informed. For the first time, because of technology, we have the ability to be live from many locations around the globe. And because of the format, an all-news network, we can spend whatever time is necessary uh, to bring the viewer the complete context of that day's portion of the story. And by context, I mean the institutional memory that is critical to understand why and how. And that's those who are analysts and do commentary, uh, and those who can uh, explain. Slug that last piece, um, ITN, Israel, post-war. David Brinkley once said that you step in front of the camera and you get out of news business and into show business. But nonetheless, that should not in any way subtract or obscure 
the need for the basic standards of good journalism. Pat, hang tight. Let me give you a lead for Salinger right now, okay? Uh, President Bush and Prime Minister Major have, uh, have uh, closed uh, or have almost rejected uh, the Soviet uh, peace talk, peace efforts. Okay, in Saudi Arabia, the door is being left open. Uh, Rick Salinger is standing by live in Riyadh with the ladies. All but closed. Yeah, all but closed. Right. Accuracy, speed, a fair approach, an honesty and integrity within the reporter to try and bring the truth, whatever the truth may be. Uh, going to war is a serious business. In a totalitarian society, the uh, dictator just says, we're going to war, and everybody marches. And with this weapon of human brotherhood in our hands, we are seeing the war for men's minds, not as a battle of truth against lies, but as a lasting alliance pledged in faith with all those millions driving forward to create the true new order, the world order of the people first, the people before all. In a democratic society, the theory is that if the political leadership has committed the war, they present reasons and they got a very heavy burden of proof to meet because the war is a very catastrophic affair as this one proved to be. Uh, the role of the media at that point is to uh, allow, is to present the relevant background, for example, the possibilities of peaceful settlement, such as what they may be, have to be presented, and then to present, uh, to offer a forum, in fact, encourage a forum of debate over this very dread decision to go to war and, in this case, kill hundreds of thousands of people and leave two countries wrecked and so on. Uh, that never happened. Uh, the, there was never, uh, well, you know, when I say never, I mean 99.9% .9 of the discussion uh, excluded the option of a peaceful settlement. That Washington's Office of War Information calls one of the most vital and constructive tasks of this war. This is a people's war, and to win it, the people ought to know as much about it as they can. This office will do its best to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, both at home and abroad. First weapon in this worldwide strategy of truth is the great machine of information represented by the free press, with its powers of molding public thought and leading public action with all its lifelines for the exchange of new ideas between fighting nations spread across the earth. And every time George Bush would appear and say there will be no negotiations, there would be a you know, hundred editorials the next day lauding him for going the last mile for diplomacy. Uh, if he said, uh, you can't reward an aggressor, instead of cracking up in ridicule the way people did in the civilized sectors of the world, like the whole third world, uh, the media said, oh man, a fantastic principle, you know, the invader of Panama, the only head of state. Uh, stands condemned for aggression in the world. The uh, guy was head of the CIA during the Timor aggression. You know, he says aggressors can't be rewarded. The media just applauded. The motion picture industry, with its worldwide organization of newsreel camera crews, invaluable for bringing into vivid focus the background drama and perspectives of the war. Mobilized too in this all-out struggle for men's minds are the radio networks with all their experience in the swift reporting of great occasion and event. From every strategic center and frontline stronghold, their reporters are sending back the lessons of new tactics, new ways of war. The result was it's a media war. I mean, there's tremendous fakery all along the line. Uh, the UN is finally living up to its mission. You know, wondrous sea change, the New York Times told us. The only wondrous sea change was that for once the United States didn't veto a Security Council resolution against aggression. People don't want a war unless you have to have one. And they would have known that you don't have to have one. Well, the media kept people from knowing that. Uh, and that means we went to war very much in the manner of a totalitarian state, thanks to the media subservience. That's the big story. Now, remember, I'm not talking about a small radio station in Laramie. I'm talking about the national agenda-setting media. If you're on a radio news show in Laramie, chances are very strong that you pick up what was in the Times that morning and you decide that's the news. In fact, if you follow the AP wires, you find that in the afternoon they send across tomorrow's front page of the New York Times. That's so that everybody knows what the news is. And the perceptions and the perspectives and so on are sort of transmitted down, and not to the precise detail, but the general picture is pretty much transmitted elsewhere.
The foreign news comes here to the foreign news desk. The editor is Bob Hanley. Bob, I suppose you uh, get far more foreign news than you can possibly use in the paper. Yes, we do. We get a great deal more than we can accommodate in a day. And your, your job is to weed it out, I suppose. This is the selection center, as it were. And uh, when I have selected it, I pass it across the desk to one or the other of these sub-editors. It comes back to me, and on this chart, I design the page. That is page one and page two. Fine, Bob. Thank you very much. Why do you want to make a film about media? Well... It's such a nice, quiet town. It's a beautiful town. <laughs> well, we're making a film about the mass media, so we thought, whatever, oh, yeah. what a good place you to come. You want to know where they got the name. So maybe you could start by introducing yourself. Yes, I'm Bowden Senko. I'm the Main Street Manager and the Executive Director of the Media Business Authority. And we are in Media, Delaware County, uh, in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania. Media is called everybody's hometown. The motto was developed as a way to promote the community. We're a very high promotion conscious community. When you walk through media, you'll be treated very well, and you find that people have taken the idea of being everybody's hometown to heart. The uh, local paper, the um, talk of the town. The town talk. <laughs> do you read that? Oh, yes, I read the town talk, yes. What, what do you think the difference is between the Wall Street Journal and the talk of the talk? Oh, well, I mean, the town talk is completely local news, and uh, it, it's fun, it's nice to read, it's interesting. You read about your neighbors and see what's going on in the school district and things like that. We're in business make bucks, just like the big daily newspapers and just like the big radio stations, and we do quite well, and rightfully so, because we work very hard at it. I just want to show you a copy of the paper here, the way it is this week. It's, it's, it's plastic wrapped on all four sides, weatherproof, and hung on everybody's front door, and many, many times you'll find that this paper runs well over 100 pages a week this particular edition. You have to remember there are five editions. This happens to be the Central Delaware County edition, which is the edition that covers media Pennsylvania. What you see here now is the advertising and composition department. Say hello, guys, will you? Hi. Hi. Hi uh, and what we're doing now is we're putting red dots, green dots, and yellow dots up on the map, wherever there is a store. Now, the red dots are the stores that don't advertise with us at all. The green dots are the ones that advertise with us every week, and the yellow dots are the ones that would run sporadically. Now, we have computer mounts of every one of these stores, and what we do is we take the printouts of all the red dots, which are the bad guys, and what our idea is is to turn these red dots into yellow dots and turn the yellow dots into green dots and eventually make them all green dots so 100% of the stores and 100% of the merchants and the service people advertise in our newspaper every week. That way we won't have any more red dots. I guess there'll always be a few red dots, but I have high hopes that there'll be a lot more green ones or red ones when we're finished. Hi, I'm Jim Morgan. I'm with the Corporate Relations Department of the New York Times, and I'm here to take you on a tour of the New York Times, so let's begin. So, they're just taking audio uh, in here. Yeah, they're taking audio in here. Audio. No cameras, no still. We went over this quite thoroughly. They don't even take a still camera in here. So we're in the composing room. This is where the pages are composed. This is the typographical area. What's the ratio of um, news to advertising? 60% ads. Um, this might seem uh, uh, big, but uh, it, it is average, in fact, below average. Our 60% might include, on some days, maybe uh, 20 pages of classified advertising all to itself, where the rest of the newspapers weighted much heavier news to advertising. But the paper, in its entirety, every day, large or small, is 60 ads, 40 news. Well, that uh, completes our tour of the New York Times, and I hope you found it uh, informative, and uh, I hope uh, that you uh, read the New York Times uh, every day of your life from now on. Now, there are other media, too, whose basic social role is quite different. It's diversion. There's the, the real mass media, the kinds that are aimed at, you know, the guys who, Joe Sixpack, that kind. The purpose of those media is just to dull people's brains. This is an oversimplification, but for the 80% or whatever they are, the main thing for them is to divert them, to get them to watch National Football League, 
and to worry about uh, you know mother with child with six heads or whatever you pick up in the uh, you know in the thing that you pick up on the supermarket stands and so on uh, or you know look at astrology or get involved in you know fundamentalist uh, stuff or something or just get them away you know get them away from things that matter uh, and for that it's important to uh, reduce their capacity to think the sports section is handled in another special department the sports reporter must be a specialist in his knowledge of sports. He gets his story right at the sporting event and often sends it into his paper play by play. Takes a sport. That's another crucial example of the indoctrination system, in my view. Uh, for one thing, because it, you know, it, it offers people something to pay attention to uh, that's of no importance. That keeps them from worrying about. You know, Keeps them, keeps them from worrying about things that matter to their lives that they might have some idea about doing something about. And in fact, it's striking to see the intelligence that's, that's used by ordinary people in sports. I mean, you listen to radio stations where people call in. They have the most exotic information and uh, understanding about, you know, all kind of arcane issues. And the press undoubtedly does a lot with this. I remember in high school already, I was pretty old, I suddenly asked myself at one point, why do I care if my high school team wins the football game? I mean, I don't know anybody on the team, you know. I, I, I mean, they have nothing to do with me. I mean, why am I cheering for my team? It doesn't mean it make any sense, you know. Uh, and, but the point is, it does make sense. It's a way of building up irrational attitudes of submission to authority and, you know, group cohesion behind, uh, you know, leadership elements. In fact, it's training in irrational jingoism. That's also a feature of uh, competitive sports. I think if you look closely at these things, I think they have, typically they do have functions. And that's why energy is devoted to supporting them and creating a basis for them and advertisers are willing to pay for them and so on. I'd like to ask you a question essentially about the methodology in studying the propaganda model and how would one go about doing that? Well, there are a number of ways to proceed. Uh, uh, one obvious way is to try to find more or less paired examples. Uh, history doesn't offer true controlled experiments, but it often comes pretty close. Uh, so one can find uh, uh, atrocities or abuses of one sort that on the one hand are committed by official enemies and on the other hand are committed by uh, friends and allies or by the favored state itself, by the United States in the U.S. case. And the question is whether the media accept the government framework or whether they use the same agenda, the same set of questions, the same criteria for uh, dealing with the two cases as any honest outside observer would do. If you think America's involvement in the war in Southeast Asia is over, think again. The Khmer Rouge are the most genocidal people on the face of the earth. Peter Jennings reporting from the Killing Fields, Thursday. I mean, the great act of genocide in the modern period is Pol Pot, 1975 to through 1978. That atrocity, I think it would be hard to find any example of a comparable outrage and outpouring of fury and so on and so forth. So that's one atrocity. Well, it just happens that in that case, history did set up a controlled experiment. Have you ever heard of a place called East Timor? I uh, can't say that I have. Where? <laughs> East Timor? Nope. No, huh? Well, it happens that right at that time there's another atrocity, very similar in character, but differing in one respect. We were responsible for it, not Pol Pot. Hello, I'm Louise Penny, and this is Radio Noon. If you've been listening to the program fairly regularly over the last few months, you'll know East Timor has come into the conversation more than once particularly when we were talking about foreign aid and also the war and a new world order. People wondered why, if the UN was serious about a new world order, no one was doing anything to help East Timor. The area was invaded by Indonesia in 1975. There are reports of atrocities against the Timorese people. And yet Canada and other nations have consistently voted against UN resolutions to end the occupation. Today, we're going to take a closer look at East Timor, what's happened to it, and why the international community is doing nothing to help. One of the people who have been most active is Elaine Bruyere, a photojournalist from British Columbia. She's the founder of the East Timor Alert Network, and she joins me in studio now. Hello. Hi. One uh, 
tragedy compounding a tragedy is that a lot of people don't know much about East Timor. Where is it? East Timor is just north of Australia, about 420 kilometers, and it's right between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Just south of East Timor is a deep water sea lane, perfect for U.S. submarines to pass through. There's also huge oil reserves there. One of the unique things about East Timor is that it's truly one of the last surviving ancient civilizations in that part of the world. The Timorese spoke 30 different languages and dialects amongst a group of 700,000 people. Today, less than 5% of the world's people live like the East Timorese, basically self-reliant. They live really outside of the global economic system. Small societies like the East Timorese are much more democratic and much more egalitarian, and there's much more sharing of power and wealth. Before the Indonesians invaded, most people lived in small rural villages. The old people in the village were like the university. They passed on tribal wisdom from generation to generation. Children grew up in a safe, stimulating, nurturing environment. A year after I left East Timor, I was appalled when I heard that Indonesia had invaded. They didn't want a small, independent country setting an example for the region. East Timor was a Portuguese colony. Indonesia had no claim to it, and in fact stated that they had no claim to it. During the period of colonization, uh, there was a good deal of politicization that different groups developed. A civil war broke out in August 75. ended up in a victory for Fredlin, uh, which was one of the groupings, described as populist Catholic in character with some typical leftish rhetoric. Indonesia at once started intervening. What's the situation? When did those ships come in? Uh, they started arriving since Monday. Six, seven boats together, very close to our border. No, they are not there just for fun, you know. Uh, they are preparing a massive operation. Something happened here last night that moved us very deeply. It was so far outside our experience as Australians that we'll find it very difficult to convey to you, but we'll try. Sitting on woven mats under a thatched roof in a hut with no walls, we were the target of a barrage of questioning from men who know they may die tomorrow and cannot understand why the rest of the world does not care. That's all they want, for the United Nations to care about what is happening here. The emotion here last night was so strong that we, all three of us, felt we should be able to reach out into the warm night air and touch it. Greg Shackleton at an unnamed village which we'll remember forever in Portuguese Timor. Ford and Kissinger visited Jakarta, I think it was December 5th. We know that they had requested that Indonesia delay the invasion until after they left because it would be too embarrassing. And within hours, I think, after they left, the invasion took place on December 7th. What happened on December 7th in 1975 is just one of the great, um, great evil deeds of history. Early in the morning, bombs began dropping on Dili. The number of troops that invaded Dili that day almost outnumbered the entire population of the town. And for two or three weeks, there was just, they just killed people. Yeah. 
gritos, outros a chamarem pela mãe, a esposa, né? Era, era, aquilo era, era mesmo terrível. Descanso, mas consider Indonesian aggression against Timor as the main issue of the discussion. When the Indonesians invaded, the UN reacted as it always does, calling for um, sanctions and condemnation and so on. Various watered-down resolutions were passed, but the U.S. was very clearly not going to allow anything to work. So the Timorese were fleeing into the jungles by the thousands. By late 1977-78, Indonesia set up receiving centers for those Timorese who came out of the jungle waving white flags. Those the Indonesians thought were more educated or who were suspected of belonging to Fredeline or other opposition parties were immediately killed. They took women aside and flew them off to Delhi in helicopters for use by the Indonesian soldiers. They killed children and babies. But in those days, their main strategy and their main weapon was starvation. By 1978, it was approaching really genocidal levels. The church and other sources estimated about 200,000 people killed. Uh, the U.S. backed it all the way. The U.S. provided 90% of the arms. Uh, right after the invasion, arms shipments were stepped up. When the uh, Indonesians actually began to run out of arms in 1978, the Carter administration moved in and increased arms sales. And other Western countries did the same, Canada, England, Holland, and everybody who could make a buck was in there trying to make sure they could kill more Timorese. There is no Western concern for issues of aggression, atrocities, human rights abuses, and so on, if there's a profit to be made from them. Uh, nothing could show more, it more clearly than this case. It wasn't that nobody had ever heard of East Timor. Crucial to remember that there was plenty of coverage in the New York Times and elsewhere before the invasion. The reason was that there was concern at the time over the breakup of the Portuguese Empire and what that would mean. There was a fear that it would lead to independence or Russian influence or whatever. After the Indonesians invaded, the coverage dropped. Uh, there was some, but it was strictly from the point of view of the State Department and Indonesian generals, never a Timorese refugee. As the atrocities reached their maximum peak in 1978, when it really was becoming genocidal, coverage dropped to zero in the United States and Canada, the two countries have looked at closely, literally dropped to zero. All this was going on at exactly the same time as the great protest of outrage over Cambodia. The uh, level of atrocities was comparable. In relative terms, it was probably considerably higher in Timor. It turns out right in Cambodia in the preceding years, 1970 through 1975, there was also a comparable atrocity for which we were responsible. The major U.S. attack against Cambodia uh, started with the bombings of the early 1970s. They reached a peak in 1973 and they continued up till 1975. They were directed against inner Cambodia. Very little is known about them because the media wanted it to be secret. They knew what was going on, they just didn't want to know what was happening. The CIA estimates about 600,000 killed during that five-year period, which is mostly either U.S. bombing or a U.S.-sponsored war. So that's pretty significant killing. But also, the conditions in which it left Cambodia were such that high U.S. officials predicted that about a million people would die in the aftermath just from hunger and disease because of the wreckage of the country. Pretty good evidence from U.S. government sources and scholarly sources that the intense bombardment was a significant force, maybe a critical force, in building up peasant support for the Khmer Rouge, who before that were a pretty marginal element. Uh, well, that's just the wrong story. After 1975, atrocities continued, and that became the right story, because now they're being carried out by the bad guys. Well, it was bad enough. In fact, current estimates are that, well, you know, they vary. I mean, the CIA claimed 50 to 100,000 people killed and uh, maybe another million or so who died one way or another. 
Michael Vickery is the one person who's given a really close detailed analysis. His figure is maybe 750,000 deaths above the normal. Others like Ben Kiernan suggest higher figures, but so far without a detailed analysis. Anyway, it was terrible, no doubt about it. Although the atrocities, the real atrocities, were bad enough, they weren't quite good enough for the uh, purposes needed. Within a few weeks after the Khmer Rouge takeover, the New York Times was already accusing them of genocide. At that point, maybe a couple hundred or maybe a few thousand people had been killed. And from then on, it was a drumbeat, a chorus of uh, genocide. The big bestseller on Cambodia, uh, Pol Pot, is called Murder in a Gentle Land. Up until April 17, 1975, it was a gentle land of peaceful, smiling people. And after that, some horrible holocaust took place. Very quickly, a figure of two million killed was hit upon. Uh, in fact, what was claimed was that the Khmer Rouge boast of having murdered two million people. The facts are very dramatic. Uh, in the case of atrocities committed by the official enemy, extraordinary show of outrage, exaggeration, no evidence required, faked photographs are fine, anything goes. Also, vast amount of lying. I mean, an amount of lying that would have made Stalin cringe. It was fraudulent, and we know that it was fraudulent by looking at the response to comparable atrocities for which the United States was responsible. early 70s Cambodia, Timor, two very closely paired examples. Well, the media response was quite dramatic. Back in 1980, I taught a course at Tufts University. Well, Chomsky came around to this class. He made a very powerful case uh, that the press underplayed the fact that the Indonesian government annexed this former Portuguese colony in 1975. And that if you compare it, for example, with Cambodia, where there was acreage of things, that this was a communist atrocity, whereas the other was not a communist atrocity. Well, I got quite interested in this, and I went to talk to the then deputy foreign editor of the Times. And I said, you know, we've had very poor coverage on this. And he said, you're absolutely right. There are a dozen atrocities around the world that we don't cover. This is one for various reasons. So I took it up. I was working as a reporter and writer for a small alternative radio program in upstate New York. And we received audio tapes of interviews with Timorese leaders and we were quite surprised that given the level of American involvement that there was not more coverage, indeed practically any coverage, of the large-scale Indonesian killing in the mainstream American media. We formed a small group of people to try to monitor the situation and see what we could do over time to alert public opinion to what was actually happening in East Timor. There were literally about half a dozen people who simply dedicated themselves with great commitment to getting the story to break through. And they reached a couple of people in Congress. Uh, they got to me, for example. I was able to testify at the UN and write some things. Uh, they kept at it, kept at it, kept at it. Uh, whatever is known about the subject is mainly comes from, essentially comes from their work. There's not much else. I wrote first an editorial called An Unjust War in East Timor. It had a map, and it said exactly what had happened. We then ran a dozen other editorials on it. They were read, they were entered in the congressional record, and several congressmen then took up the cause, and then something was done in Congress as a result of this. The fact that the editorial page in the New York Times on Christmas Eve published that editorial put our work on a very different level, and it gave a great deal of legitimacy to something that we were trying to uh, advance for a long time, and that was the idea and the reality that a major tragedy was unfolding in East Timor. 
if one takes literally uh, various uh, uh, theories that uh, Professor Chomsky puts out, uh, one would feel that uh, there is a tacit conspiracy between the establishment press and the government in Washington to focus on certain things and ignore certain things. So that if we uh, broke the rules, that we would instantly get a reaction, a sharp reaction from the uh, overlords in Washington who would say, hey, what are you doing speaking up on East Timor? We're trying to keep that quiet. We didn't hear a thing. What we did hear, and this was quite interesting, uh, is that there was a guy named Arnold Cohn, and he became a one-person lobby. I appreciate the nice things that Karl Meyer said about me in his interview, but I object to the notion that a one-man lobby was formed or anything like that. I think that if there weren't a large network composed of the American Catholic Bishops Conference, composed of, of other church groups, composed of human rights groups, composed of simply concerned citizens and others, and a network of concern within the news media, I think that it would have been impossible to do anything at all at any time, and it certainly would have been impossible to sustain things for as long as they've been sustained. Professor Chomsky and a lot of people uh, who engage in this kind of press analysis have one thing in common. Most of them have never worked for a newspaper. Many of them know very little about how newspapers work. When Chomsky came around, uh, he had with him a file of all the coverage in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other papers of East Timor. And he would go to the meticulous degree that if, for example, the London Times had a piece on East Timor, and then it appeared in the New York Times, that if a, if a paragraph was cut out, he'd compare and he'd say, look, this key paragraph right near the end, which is really what tells the whole story, was left out of the New York Times version of the London Times thing. There was uh, a story in the London Times, which is pretty accurate. The New York Times revised it radically and just leave a paragraph out. They revised it and gave it a totally different cast. It was then picked up by Newsweek, uh, giving it the New York Times cast. It ended up being a whitewash, whereas the original was an atrocity story. So I said to, to, to Chomsky at the time, I said, well, it may be that you're misinterpreting ignorance, haste, deadline pressure, etc., for some kind of determined effort to suppress an element of the story. He said, well, if it happened once or twice or three times, uh, I might agree with you, but if it happens a dozen times, Mr. Meyer, I think there's something else at work. And it's not a matter of happening one time, two times, five times, a hundred times. It happened all the time. I said, Professor Chomsky, having been in this business, it happens a dozen times. Uh, that uh, these are very imperfect institutions. When they did give coverage, it was from the point of view of it was it was a whitewash of the United States. Now you know that's not an error. That's systematic, consistent behavior. In this case, without even any exception. This is a much more subtle process than uh, uh, than you get uh, uh, in the in the kind of the sledgehammer rhetoric of the people that uh, make a a to b equation between what the government does, what people think, and what newspapers say uh, that uh, that sometimes what the Times does uh, can make enormous um, uh, difference at other times it has no influence whatsoever. So um, one of the greatest tragedies of our age is still happening in East Timor. The Indonesians have killed up to a third of the population. They're in concentration camps. They conduct large-scale military campaigns against the people who are resisting. Campaigns with names like Operation Eradicate or Operation Clean Sweep. Timorese women are subjected to a forced birth control program. In addition, they're bringing in a constant stream of Indonesian settlers to take over the land. Whenever people are brave enough to take to the streets in demonstrations or show the least sign of resistance, they just massacre them. It's sort of like Indonesia, if we allow them to continue to stay in East Timor, the international community, they will simply digest East Timor and turn it into, they're turning, trying to turn it into cash crop. I mean, this is way beyond just 
demonstrating the subservience of the media to power. I mean, they are actual, they have real complicity in genocide in this case. Now, the reason that the atrocities can go on is because nobody knows about them. Uh, if anyone knew about them, there'd be protests and pressure to stop them. So therefore, by suppressing the facts, the media are making a major contribution to uh, some of the, probably the worst act of genocide since the Holocaust. You say that what the media do is to ignore certain kinds of atrocities that are committed by us and our friends mm -hmm. and to play up enormously atrocities that are committed by them and, and, and our enemies. And you posit that there's a test of integrity and moral honesty, which is to have a kind of equality of treatment of corpses. Equality of principles. Uh, I mean, that every dead person should be in principle equal that's to every, every other dead person. That's not what I say at all. Well, well I'm glad that's not what you say, because, because that, that's not what you do. Of course it's not what I do. Nor would I say it. That's I mean, right. that, in that, fact, I say the opposite. What I say is that we that, should be responsible for our own actions primarily. Because your method is not only to ignore cor the corpses created by them, but also to ignore the corpses that are created by neither side, but which are irrelevant to your ideological That's agenda. totally untrue. Well, well let, let me give you an example. Okay. Um, that uh, that um, one of your one of your own causes that you take very seriously is the cause of the Palestinians, and and a Palestinian corpse weighs, weighs very heavily on your conscience, and yet a Kurdish corpse does not. That's not um, true at all. I've uh, been involved in Kurdish support groups for years. Um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a That's absolutely true. That's absolutely false. I mean, just ask the Kurdish, ask the people who are involved in. I mean, you know, they come to me. I sign their petitions and so on and so forth. And in and fact, I, if you look at the stu at the things we've written, I mean, take 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 let's take a look. I mean, I'm not Amnesty International. I can't do everything. I'm a single <laughs> universe person. But if you read, say, uh, take take a look, say, at the book that Edward Herman and I wrote on this topic. In it, we discuss three kinds of atrocities what we called benign bloodbaths, which nobody cares about, constructive bloodbaths, which are the ones we like, and nefarious bloodbaths, which are the ones that the bad guys do. The principle that I think we ought to follow is not the one that you stated. You know, it's, it's a very simple ethical point. You're responsible for the predictable consequences of your actions. You're not responsible for the predictable consequences of somebody else's actions. The most important thing uh, for me and for you is to think about the consequences of your actions. What can you affect? Uh, these are the things to keep in mind. These, these are not just academic exercises. We're not analyzing the media on Mars or in the 18th century or something like that. Uh, we're uh, dealing with real human beings who are suffering and dying and being tortured and starving uh, because of policies that we are involved in. We, as citizens of democratic societies, are directly involved in and are responsible for. And what the media are doing is ensuring that we do not act on our responsibilities and that the interests of power are served, not the needs of the suffering people and not even the needs of the American people who would be horrified if they uh, realized the blood that's dripping from their hands because of uh, the way they're uh, allowing themselves to be deluded and manipulated by the system. What about the third world? Well, uh, despite everything, and it's pretty ugly and awful, uh, these struggles are not over. The struggle for freedom and independence never is completely over. Their courage, in fact, is really remarkable and amazing. I've personally had the privilege, and it is a privilege, of witnessing it a few times in villages in Southeast Asia and Central America and recently in the occupied West Bank, and it is astonishing to see. And it's always amazing, at least to me it's amazing, I can't understand it. It's also very moving and very inspiring. In fact, it's kind of awe-inspiring. Now, they rely very crucially on a very slim margin for survival that's provided by dissidence and turbulence within the imperial societies. And how large that margin is, is for us to determine. 